Okay, so it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Parmeshwaran Ajit uh, from ICTS to deliver this uh, uh, VSM special lecture. As uh, Tanuman just mentioned, this is a second lecture in a series of four lectures that will be uh, given throughout this month. Uh, so Ajit did actually his PhD from uh, Max Planck Institute of, for Gravitational Physics and uh, Lebanese University of Hanover, Germany. Uh, during his PhD, his uh, research focus was on various aspects of the gravitational wave detection. That includes the detector characterization, data analysis, and uh, source modeling for uh, ground-based detectors. After completing his PhD, he moved on to Caltech for uh, his postdoctoral study where he spent almost four years. And uh, fortunately, I was also there at that time and uh, we became quite good friend uh, at Caltech. So that's how we know each other. And uh, after Caltech, uh, he was uh, again mostly studying the various aspects of the gravitational wave detection. And then he came back to India and joined the ICTS, uh, TFR Bangalore Center as a faculty. Uh, since then. Uh, his uh, research work uh, has been uh, recognized nationally and internationally and has received uh, several awards and recognitions, which just to name a couple of them, uh, he has been awarded the Grubber Cosmology Prize in 2016 and a Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics at the same year as a part of the LIGO Virgo collaborations. And uh, recently in 2019, he was awarded uh, NRS and the Young Researcher Award by the Indian Associations for uh, Gender Relativity and uh, Gravitation. Uh, his uh, research work has been, as I mentioned, mostly focused on the various aspects of the gravitational wave astronomy. And uh, that includes the modeling of the gravitational wave sources by combining the analytical and uh, numerical relativity the data analysis for the gravitational waves, interpretation of the observations. And uh, as you probably be aware that the gravitational waves have very weak signals, basically. So it's kind of very puzzling or tricky to detect uh, the sources. And uh, Ajit has been actively involved in developing some novel techniques to distinguish between the actual gravitational wave triggers and the uh, spurious uh, instrumental signals. Uh, so, Today, uh, he will be uh, telling us about uh, the gravitational wave lensing of gravitational waves, a new frontier. So without taking much time, I would request uh, Ajit to start the lecture. Ajit. Thank you, Vikram, for the very kind introduction. Yes, as you said, I, I fondly remember the, spend, the time that we spent together in Pasadena with you and your family. It was a great time. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, uh, I, I wanted to thank the uh, organizers for this uh, very serious meetings, uh, especially Tanuman Kosh and, and, and friends for this invitation. Um, I would have liked to come to RRI. It's been a while, um, but uh, looks like I need to wait for some more time for that. Um, so today, let me try to share the screen. Today, I'm going to talk about a sort of a relatively new area or a subtopic in the field of gravitational wave astronomy, which, um, as all of you know, and as uh, Vikram mentioned, has sort of opened up a, like a new branch of astronomy. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to talk about the lensing, the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves. Um, we know that the gravitational lensing of light um, has been a, a powerful tool for astronomers for the last few decades. And, um, and interestingly, some of the pioneering work in this field has been done by you know, people like uh, Ramesh Narayan and uh, Rajaram Nityananda, et cetera, who were um, um, you know, members and alumni of, of uh, RRI several decades ago. Um, so it, it's, it's great to um, talk about this sort of new aspect of lensing to this um, community of, uh, of experts. I should sort of apologize a little bit um, that I was sort of expecting more of a uh, student type audience. And uh, 
at least the first half of my talk is going to be fairly uh, light. So I, I, um, I apologize to the experts in this, this audience. And I, I hope that you will have something more interesting and, and technical coming up in this, the latter half of this talk. Um, so let me start with the, you know, in the beginning, as, as all of you know, the uh, general theory of relativity uh, is the most accurate theory of gravity that we have now. And this is the theory that predicts uh, several uh, very interesting phenomena, including gravitational lensing or uh, as well as gravitational waves. And just to remind you that this, according to GR, the uh, gravity is, the, is a manifestation of the curvature of space time and produced by massive objects as well as other forms of energy. And uh, this can produce a, a number of interesting consequences. For example, the sun would curve the space time around it, which means that the light as well as gravitational waves would follow the uh, geodesic of this curved space time, um, which are not straight lines. And uh, this can have a number of interesting observational consequences. For example, uh, a ray of light that is gracing the, the limb of the sun, for example, from a distant star would bend. And a, an observer who is looking at the, from the other side of the sun, from the earth, would see that the apparent position of the star has shifted. And since we know the uh, mass of the sun, we can calculate the, uh, the shift in the angular position of the stars. Uh, which was done by Einstein, um, and Einstein made a prediction that the gravitational bending of light, so this, this, this uh, light from a, uh, a distant star whose rays are, you know, gracing the sun would, would bend by a particular amount. And uh, this um, prediction was verified uh, almost 100 years ago by a team of astronomers led by uh, Arthur Eddington and, 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 and colleagues. Um, and uh, we recently celebrated, a couple of years ago, celebrated the 100th year of, the, uh, of Eddington's uh, observation of the gravitational bending of light. And uh, the right photograph shows a, uh, an actual photograph, uh, photograph uh, plate taken by Eddington and colleagues during this eclipse. And uh, you can see the, the solar corona. And um, if you look very, very carefully, you can see um, the stars in the, uh, in the highest cluster. Um, and since it's not very visible, um, I have made a, a cartoon version of this plot. And uh, this is what the uh, um, photographs showed. Uh, you can see the, um, the, in this photograph, the, the position of the stars during the eclipse um, is shown by the red stars, which is, uh, you can compare against, and they, they actually compare against the actual relative position of the stars, which was uh, taken um, when these same cluster of stars was there in the night sky. So when there is uh, no sun in between the stars and the earth. And, and then that is shown by these um, blue, uh, blue stars. And you can see that the, uh, during the eclipse, when the sun was in between us and the stars, the apparent position of the stars was shifted. And the closer the, the stars are to, the, are to the limb of the sun, the larger is the angular shift. And the shift is of the order of about a couple of arc second, which was uh, predicted by Einstein's theory. And uh, the observations were consistent with the predictions of Einstein's theory. And this was um, interesting sort of history of science. This was uh, sort of celebrated uh, worldwide. This came up in the uh, New York Times. The front page of New York Times is shown on the right uh, side. It um, emphatically declares that Einstein theory, and Einstein's theory triumphs, etc. And the stars were not the not where they seem to be uh, or where they calculated to be, but nobody need to worry, etc. Uh, it was not only celebrated in, in sort of the Western, more developed world, but even uh, in India, this was this came in, in news within like a week's time. The left uh, newspaper cutting is from the Calcutta newspaper, The Statesman, uh, in which uh, Meghna Saha wrote an article in which um, uh, he writes that if this um, observations hold, 
our uh, understanding of the nature of space and time would change, um, uh, um, you know, completely would, would, would undergo a revolutionary change. And, and this is what uh, actually happened in the last century. Uh, we know that our understanding of, of space and time um, uh, had basically undergone a, a tremendous change from uh, what used to be uh, more than a century ago. And now uh, coming back to the uh, gravitational bending of light, a uh, much more dramatic forms of the gravitational bending of light is a, is a commonplace phenomenon in, in modern astronomy. Now it's called gravitational lensing in which basically massive objects like galaxies and clusters or even compact objects, yeah, uh, massive um, galaxies and clusters uh, acts as a lens to focus light because of their, their the curvature of space time caused by their mass. And this light can um, converge and focus and produce even uh, multiple images. This is called strong lensing. So here is an example of such a, such a system uh, is, a, is a cartoon example. And you can see this, um, um, so here we are on the earth and there is a, a background galaxy here or a field of galaxies. And there is an, a galaxy is a massive galaxy in between us and the source which acts as a lens to focus light and depending on the geometry of the lens, this can produce um, uh, multiple images, uh, et cetera. And um, this is what is called a strong lensing. And uh, here are some um, real examples of, of, of lensing. Uh, depending on the uh, density of the mass distribution that is causing the lens, uh, the lensing can be called strong lensing, weak lensing, or micro lensing, uh, in which so for example, in this strong lensing is the, the, uh, the lensing mass distribution has a, a density greater than a critical density so that there are multiple null geodesics connecting the source and the observer. And this produces basically multiple images of the source. So here is a, a dramatic example of a strongly lensed quasar and depend, because of the, the, the geometry of this lens, it produces a quadruple image. There are uh, four images of a distant quasar uh, produced by this, this, this strong lens. Uh, the middle plot shows an example of what is called the weak lensing, where the, uh, le the density of the mass distribution is less than a critical density. So it, it is not strong enough to produce multiple images, but um, you can see this uh, a characteristic arcs in this in this um, image. So there's a, a field of galaxies, and um, and even though uh, this lensing is not strong enough to produce multiple images of a single galaxy, it produces a distortion in the image, which is characteristic of this uh, weak lensing. And and um, in principle, for example, if you knew the actual um, uh, shapes of the gal galaxies in the background field. Uh, and if you measure this deformed shape, these arc shapes, et cetera, you can basically uh, solve the uh, lens equation to get the, 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 the geometry or the mass distribution of the lens that is caused, that is causing this particular uh, deformation of the image. In, in practice, so this is for us analogous to, for example, um, if you, for example, have uh, you know, regular grid lines in a swimming pool and the water is oscillating on the, uh, in the swimming pool, this would distort the reg regular grid line that we seen in the bottom of the swimming pool. And, um, and, and if you have these regular grid lines by looking at the distorted image, you can actually calculate the refractive index of the water, et cetera. And um, here uh, you do not, of course, have a reference image uh, because we only have the lens image of the background galaxies, but making certain statistical assumptions of the orientation of the galaxies, et cetera, one could actually infer um, the presence of, uh, of this lens and, as, um, and, and one could even get uh, estimates of the geometry of the lens by uh, statistical methods. And that's a very active field in, in cosmology, et cetera. Um, another um, a case where the um, is, is the so-called micro lens, where the lens mass or lens density is much less than the critical um, density. And here the examples are things like uh, stars or compact objects, et cetera, which are not massive enough to produce multiple images. But here, if for example, if there is a time dependent uh, change in the location of, of the lens, uh, then the lens mass can come in between uh, us and the source in a time dependent way, there is a transverse motion, 
then this would change a time this would make a time dependent change in the magnification of the of the distant source and here is a, a cartoon example of a compact object that is coming in between a star and the us and if this compact object transits in between us and the source that would magnify this the star's light and produce a um, a bump in the in the time dependent uh, magnification and this is used to detect uh, potentially uh, compact objects or even stellar systems and planets etc uh, in the case of um, planets which i'll come in a minute um, the gravitational lensing has now become a, a powerful tool for astronomy um, there are uh, many many examples of how um, the gravitational lensing is used to uh, probe unseen Ajit, i have a question yeah. so in your previous slide you showed the time dependent bump right yes time dependent you said over a time scale you see a magnification yeah. can it mimic like a flare um it is the time scales are typically much longer like days or months but flare can be also days and months uh yes then yes yes okay see? okay hmm. and i i don't know when it depends on what you call a flare but yeah you would see a, a, a like a starlight brightening up for a period okay, okay. yeah thanks and if for example if this uh, lens is some kind of a stellar system which has planets around them then apart from this you know sort of these gaussian large gaussian packet that we see here and if there are there are planets around the star, then this star can also contribute additional small spikes in these Gaussian type magnification. And these are sort of telltale um, signs of planetary systems. And people have used these microlensing signatures to detect exoplanets, for example. Um, and the lensing has been used now as a, a powerful uh, tool for uh, astronomy, uh, in, in particular to probe unseen mass distributions like dark matter. So here, are, here is one example of how weak lensing has been used to reconstruct the mass distribution of a cluster. So here is the, I hope you can see my cursor. The left plot shows the uh, a galactic field and from or a field of galaxies, uh, not a galactic field, I apologize. So um, this, this uh, green contour shows the uh, reconstructed mass distribution of a cluster that is causing a weak lensing effect on this, this uh, field of galaxies and by inversely solving, you know, by inverting the lens equation. So, and, and you can see this, 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 for example, this masses of this cluster are concentrated in, in this region and this region. And that if you, when people looked at this uh, same cluster, which is called the bullet cluster in X-rays, it turns out that the luminosity of this cluster, the, the emission is more concentrated in, in regions other than uh, where the, the mass seems to be concentrated. So the conclusion is that um, this, most of the, the mass of this cluster is in, is in the form of dark matter, which is, has an offset from the, the luminous part of the galaxy. So here's an example of how uh, dark matter is um, uh, the presence of dark matter in, in large clusters and um, the weak lensing of galaxies has been used to to map out the distribution of dark matter as a function of redshift and uh, interestingly some of the lensing also magnifies the signal by means of strong lensing this means that um, some of the um, dim galaxies can be seen, or it, sometimes even uh, stars can be seen at very large distances because of the lensing magnification. I will uh, come. I will show you some examples of that uh, to motivate similar possible effects in the case of uh, the lensing of gravitational waves, also. So that lensing sort of can be can act as a magnifying glass to to to, to look at very very distant galaxies and stars that otherwise would not have been visible using um, our telescopes. Um, there are uh, lensing is like micro lensing in particular is also used to to um, to constrain the nature of dark matter. Um, as you know, we have several lines of evidence that uh, a significant fraction of the mass in the universe is in the form of dark matter, which exerts its gravitational influence on other luminous objects. And there are two main sort of categories for the candidates of dark matter. One is uh, 
fundamental particles that are beyond the standard model of particle physics. Um, and uh, other is the possibility is that the dark matter could be comprised of a large number of uh, compact objects, which are uh, generically named uh, machos. Uh, and if they are indeed um, a significant fraction of this dark matter is indeed in the form of um, compact objects, uh, then they would create uh, microlensing effects in the starlight, uh, for example, from our neighboring galaxy. So there are uh, several uh, groups that looked at uh, neighboring galaxies uh, and seen through our the dark matter halo of our own galaxy. And the idea is that if this our dark matter halo has comprise, is comprised of many compact objects, some of these compact objects would cause microlensing of the starlight from the our neighboring galaxies. And the absence of such observations has been used to put constraints on the abundance of such uh, machos or the compact object that form the uh, dark matter. So here is such a, a constrained plot. Um, this is uh, an x-axis is the mass of the uh, uh, compact object that can potentially form, um, uh, consist of, uh, that can form dark matter. So here is, for example, this is in the, in the solar masses, and it goes from 10 to the minus 15 to uh, 10 to the 5 solar mass. And this is, for example, the microlensing constraint from the Subaru observation, one of the recent, most recent ones. And here, for example, they have ruled out this region of the parameter space. So, so the statement is that uh, the dark only something like you know ten uh, less than a percent of the dark matter could be comprised of compact objects in the mass range of ten to the minus thirteen to ten to the minus eight solar masses. And uh, similar, uh, so in the here we are using a non-detection of lensing signatures to put constraints on the compact um, uh, objects. And while a positive detection has been used. To, to detect uh, planets outside of our solar system called the exoplanets, et cetera. So now I'm kind of switching gears a little bit. Um, um, the gravitational lensing is only one of the many interesting predictions of Einstein's theory. We know that uh, all of his predictions, this, the theory's predictions have been verified with uh, remarkable accuracy, including the gravitational uh, redshift, uh, existence of black holes, expansion of the universe, um, you know, Shapiro delay, all kinds of uh, measurements have been performed with, uh, and all of these ex um, experiments and observations agreed with Einstein's theory, uh, the predictions of Einstein's theory. And the latest of this sort of pseudo tests has been the uh, detection, direct detection of, of, of gravitational waves. Of course, we have had uh, indirect evidence that gravitational waves did exist um, from the observations of radio pulsars. Um, and um, gravitational waves, as you know, are basically uh, wave-like solutions of Einstein's equations. They are uh, freely propagating oscillations in the geometry of space-time. Uh, they propagate at the speed of light. And uh, uh, the about uh, six years ago, uh, LIGO observatories made the first uh, direct detection of gravitational waves passing through the Earth. And uh, since then, uh, LIGO and its sister observatory called Virgo in the, in the, in the Europe uh, have made uh, detection of more than 50 gravitational wave signals from coalescing compact binaries, uh, including uh, binaries of double black holes or double neutron stars, as well as a mixed binary of a neutron star and a black hole. So uh, all kinds of combinations of compact objects uh, forming binaries. So here is a, a, a like a character sort of some schematic description of the um, compact objects that LIGO and Virgo have um, observed in the past six years. So the vertical axis here is the mass of the compact object in, in solar masses. The horizontal axis has no meaning. And in um, each of them, uh, each of the signal is produced by a compact binary coalescence in which two compact objects move in move around each other producing gravitational waves, eventually losing their energy and angular momentum and colliding with each other, producing uh, most of the time a, a rapidly spinning black hole. And sometimes it could be a potentially a, 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 a neutron star uh, also. And uh, so each sort of binary coalescence involves sort of three objects. You start with a binary system of two compact objects merging to form a much more compact, much more massive 
um, compact object. So, and here are these blue dots are the black hole um, systems that were discovered by uh, LIGO and Virgo. And in contrast, these purple dots are the black holes discovered by X-ray observations from our own galaxy through uh, uh, X-ray binaries. And uh, similarly, these uh, orange dots are the binary neutron stars that um, LIGO and Virgo have discovered. Um, and these yellow dots shows the uh, radio pulsars um, uh, for which the mass measurement exists uh, uh, from the form of binary pulsars. Um, so one point that I would like you to notice is not is that these um, LIGO observatories and, and Virgo um, have not yet reached their design sensitivities. They are continuing to improve their sensitivities. And each uh, factor of two improvement in the sensitivity would increase the, the, the detection rate by a factor of eight because they are directly sensitive to the amplitude of the gravitational wave. So each factor of two would increase our volume, detection volume by a factor of two cube. And um, this, just by scaling this uh, detection volume, we expect the detection of several hundreds to a few thousand compact binary collisions in the next few years as these detectors improve their sensitivity. Um, so, um, so we are really opening up a new branch of astronomy by the observations of these, these, these objects. Uh, even um, these existing observations have provided some uh, remarkable amount of very interesting science. So it's very hard to summarize everything in this such a um, short talk, but let me give you some very, uh, some, some important bullet points, uh, uh, to highlights of, of these discoveries. One is um, these uh, observations of gravitational waves have provided us the first evidence of merging binary black hole systems and merging black hole neutron star systems. They have uncovered the, the existence of a new population of heavy black holes, which are more massive than about 30 times the mass of the sun. Uh, there are some, there is one, at least a potential evidence of, a, of an intermediate mass black hole, which is the, from the observation of this particular signal called GW190521. And we expect that the remnant of this merger would have, uh, would be an intermediate mass black hole, which is more massive than about 100 solar masses. And, and finally, this uh, multi-messenger observation of a binary neutron star merger, the much celebrated GW170817, um, has basically inaugurated this multi-messenger astronomy in a very, very large way. And these observations have um, enabled uh, powerful probes of fundamental physics, in particular the tests of Einstein's theory in the regime of extreme velocities and extreme gravitational fields, um, and some aspects of nuclear physics also to the um, constraints on the equation of state of nuclear matter at extreme densities. Um, they also have provided some very interesting um, tools for astrophysics and cosmology, for example. Now we know that we have a conclusive evidence that at least a good fraction of these short gamma ray bursts are produced by the mergers of um, compact objects, in particular neutron stars. Um, they have provided a, a new way of measuring the cosmic expansion rate and to estimate uh, the Hubble constant, et cetera. And while some of the precision of some of these existing measurements are fairly poor, um, uh, we would expect them to improve in the next few years with, the, um, with more and more observations coming up. So these observations also have uncovered new mysteries. They also have opened up new questions. So for example, we still don't uh, know what is the precise astrophysical uh, mechanism in which these um, black hole binaries form, in particular these binaries involving these heavy black holes. Uh, which are rather difficult to form through standard stellar collapse, et cetera, but it's not you know, impossible. So there are, um, um, I encourage those of you who are interested to look at um, these the publications. The, the literature is quite vast and rapidly expanding. It's very hard to keep up with the, the literature, but here are some like a one page where you have uh, a collection of all the publications, the LIGO scientific collaboration and the Virgo collaboration and some uh, accessible uh, science summaries also. So, and um, in the next few years, with the observations of hundreds to thousands of sources, we- uh, Sir, there is a question in the chat box. Okay. Uh, okay, the question is, uh, uh, from the last slide, it appears that gravitational waves are more sensitive to larger masses 
as well as lower mass uh, compact objects when compared with electromagnetic observations. How does one understand this? I think the previous slide, right? Or... Yeah, the previous slide, yes. So uh, gravitational wave vectors are, you know, um, uh, rightly sensitive to higher masses. You're, you're right because they are, um, uh, the the energy of the gravitational waves is proportional to the uh, some power of mass. So they have a larger amplitude. That's how you know uh, they produce louder signals, and 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 that's that would allow us to see the the binary black the heavy binary black holes at larger um, uh, distance in the universe, and we have access to a larger volume. But uh, at some point, the, it also means that higher mass black holes would also produce lower frequency signals. Higher, higher the uh, mass, the larger is the time scale, and the lower is the frequency. And hence, eventually, if you go to too high masses, the gravitational waves would basically merge at a frequency. So the binary black holes would merge at a frequency that is lower than the detection frequency band of LIGO. So there is some upper limit also. So there is, if you, for example, plot the sort of horizon distance of LIGO, there is a sweet spot of, of the order of hundreds of solar masses. So that's why we are more, uh, we have a selection bias towards higher masses. I do not think that we have a selection bias towards lower mass objects. Uh, if we see lower mass objects, then it mostly means that there is an excess abundance of lower mass objects in the universe. I, there are I some was, really- sorry. Yeah, I was thinking of the, the, the plot, the lowest column, which is LIGO, Virgo, neutron stars. They seem to be very numerous at low masses. The, Sorry, the there's probably a, a color confusion, uh, Sam. Uh, the LIGO, Virgo, neutron stars are the orange dots. There are only five. The rest are the radio pulsars. That LIGO, Virgo, neutron stars represent the, the, the writing under electromagnetic neutron stars is LIGO, Virgo, neutron stars. So you, apparently with using LIGO and Virgo, you can see very low mass objects. That's what is puzzling me. No, no, so this, I think there's probably a confusion in the color coding. So the LIGO, okay. Virgo, neutron stars are the orange ones, like this one, this one, this one, etc. There are only five of them. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. That, that resolves my confusion. Yeah, yeah, the yellow ones are the radio pulsars. Okay. But you're right, there is a selection bias towards high mass black holes because of the, their, um, uh, brightness in gravitational waves. Does it does that answer your question, Sam? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you. But uh, it will also depend on the redshift. Whether you can. That's detect. right. So yeah. So the the redshift the redshift also eventually would would uh, bring these signals uh, to uh, frequency band below our sensitivity band. So so that there is a, an issue there also. You're right. So uh, coming back, so the, um, in the next few several years, we are expecting the detection of hundreds to thousands of um, gravitational signals, which will um, enable us to probe some very interesting questions in, in astrophysics, uh, fundamental physics and cosmology. For example, what is the nature of um, black holes? You know, are they, they are indeed the black holes predicted by you know, general relativity following the Nohair theorem, et cetera. Uh, and how do these um, black holes, bi binaries of black holes form? Um, are they primordial black holes? Are they intermediate mass black holes? Um, they enable some um, very interesting probes of, of uh, GR and, and the nature of black holes. Uh, some um, interesting observations of neutron stars can provide some light on the uh, nuclear physics uh, at extreme densities because uh, what during the uh, in spiral of two neutron stars, they would get tidally deformed, which would have an imprint on the gravitational wave signal. And the amount of tidal deformation depends on the equation of state at, of the nuclear matter at these densities. So we can put some constraints on the equation of state of nuclear matter by the observation of gravitational waves from double neutron star systems. These um, joint observations of gravitational waves and the electromagnetic waves from the same merger, like the case of these uh, binary neutron star merger, would enable us to measure the cosmic expansion rate. This is because these gravitational, uh, the compact binary coalescences are um, absolutely calibrated standard candles, um, uh, analogous to supernovae, but uh, 
in some sense, they have an actual calibration, unlike the case of supernovae. And they have, so that, that provides a different way of measuring the cosmic expansion rate. There are, um, one would hope that there are some possibility of detecting, um, okay, so there are known unknowns. We, we expect the detection of a stochastic gravitation wave background produced by a large number of astrophysical sources, such as the cosmic, um, sorry, such as the, the compact planetary call essences. Uh, there is a potential that is very difficult to detect the cosmic um, uh, cosmological gravitation wave background. Um, there are also more uh, promising sources as, like galactic supernovae or spinning neutron stars, etc. And finally, there is also um, the complete unknowns, which uh, one could one should be open to. Um, and among such things of new possible sort of signals that we are looking for is the gravitational lensing of gravitational mm -hmm. waves. And here, uh, recent calculations have shown that a, a small fraction of the binary black holes that we anticipate to detect in the next few years could be strongly lensed by intervening galaxies and can produce even multiple images like this, this example of this multiply lensed quasar. And um, this probability is quite small, which is of the order of 0.1% to 0.3% or something. But because we are expecting the detection of hundreds to thousands of sources, this means that uh, within a few years, we anticipate, we can expect the detection of a couple of such lensed sources. And um, this is analogous to this, this strongly lensed quasar. But here, since these signals are transient, the gravitational wave signals last only for the, you know, a second or a, you know, a fraction of a second, we can observe the time delay between multiple images quite accurately. So what we would see that the one copy of the signal would arrive today. And after a few minutes or, a, or even a few, up, up to a few weeks, the next copy would arrive. And, um, and the, these images would in principle have a separation, but we cannot measure that image separation in the sky very accurately because of the poor angular resolution of the gravitational wave antennas. However, uh, they are very well separated uh, temporarily. So we can measure the time delay between them extremely well, which can provide some very interesting tests of um, you know, Einstein's theory and uh, some possibly uh, some cosmological measurements in the future. So you know, within a hundred years after Einstein's uh, Eddington's observation of the gravitational uh, bending of light, we are on the verge of detecting the gravitational lensing of, of gravitational waves. And this, um, this can, so why, why are we so excited about this? There are um, uh, you know, a few reasons and we can take basically motivation from what the electromagnetic lens and lensing have sort of entailed in the last two decades. Um, one is that uh, the, the magnification of the, uh, of the gravitation waves due to lensing would enable us to detect a few sources at extremely large distances. So uh, here also, in, in a, most of the, the dominant lenses are galaxies, which has a very large mass, and, um, and their, their um, gravitational length scale is very large as compared to the wavelength of gravitational waves. So hence, one could treat the whole lensing problem in pure geometric optics. And the, this means that the lensing would only uh, magnify or demagnify the signals without changing their, their shapes or, or frequency profile. And very rare, so there is this magnification, distribution of magnification, and it's very rarely that we get a very high magnification. So very rarely we get a highly magnified signal, which will allow us to see a very, very distant source, which would not have been detected uh, otherwise. And there are some examples of this in, uh, in the lensing of electromagnetic waves. Here is a, a remarkable example uh, that came a few years ago. And here, this left observation shows a, a distant star that is like a uh, about three billion parsecs, so three gigaparsecs away, about nine billion light years away, which is magnified by more than two thousand times by a galaxy, uh, a, 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 a galactic cluster that happens to be in between us and the source, and which basically enabled these astronomers to observe a, a single star at a distance of gigaparsec, which is unheard of in astronomy. So this kind of you know, extreme examples are very rare, 
But in general, we would expect that this lensing would increase the horizon distance of gravitational detectors. So we would be able to observe a few uh, highly magnified disk signals, which would uh, enable us to observe uh, binary mergers happening at you know, extreme cosmological distances. Um, another uh, interesting thing that we need to keep in mind is that uh, these these, this magnification of the signals would actually bias our observation because essentially we do not know if you observe a single signal, signal magnified signal, whether it's lensed or unlensed. So uh, a, a, a distant source that is highly magnified is practically equal to a, a nearby source. So if you were to estimate its distance by matching templates, essentially we would infer that we would only buy, uh, infer a biased luminosity distance. We would underestimate its actual distance. And uh, in the case of gravitational waves, because Nayantara brought out this idea of uh, uh, the gravitational redshift, sorry, the cosmological redshift, the gravitational waves would be redshifted because of the cosmological expansion. And, um, and it turns out that this is indistinguishable from the mass associated with, this, with the gravitational waveform. And this is basically a reflection of the fact that uh, GR has no preferred scale. So every time scale is rescalable with mass. So if a signal is redshifted, uh, it means that the time scales are stretched. You can basically match that redshifted signal with a, a template that corresponds to a larger mass, a signal template corresponds to a larger mass. So we would essentially overestimate the mass of the binary that is producing a lensed gravitational signal. And this could cause an actual observational bias. In fact, some people have argued that these heavy, heavy black holes that, that LIGO has observed uh, are nothing but lensed gravitational signals. However, this is not shared, this excitement and this claim is not shared by most of the community. If you put in the, uh, the, the, our best understood models of the um, lensing optical depth and the star formation rate, et cetera, this claim seems to be um, highly exotic and so don't, most people don't buy this, this, this claim. However, this possibility still exists. So if you want to know, distinguish between these two possibilities that you know, how do you actually detect a lens gravitation wave, the, the clear, the telltale example is, is multiple images as we have seen in the case of this quasar. So basically uh, that is something that we need to look for and, and something we have been looking for also. So what you would see is in the case of gravitational waves, if you want to look for lensing uh, in, in a year's worth of data, which has you know, thousands of gravitational wave signals, we expect the possibility of seeing a few copies uh, in a few events that are multiply imaged. So you could see um, <clears throat> a few multiple copies of the same signal in, in a data segment corresponding to you know, a year. Which, which has basically you know, a few hundred unrelated signals also. So this is, so your question is, uh, can you identify um, like a pair of signals is are produced by uh, like a lensed copies of the single merger or they are unrelated. So identifying these uh, you know, few lens copies of, of mergers is a, is a challenging task because of the poor signal to noise ratio of gravitational waves. So unlike the case of this image, which is extremely clear, and in the case of gravitational waves, the signal to noise ratio is still of the order of 10 or 20. And um, one cannot make this statement extremely precisely. So one has to re you know, resort to some kind of a statistical techniques. So um, our group uh, developed a, a Bayesian uh, model selection techniques to identify um, strongly lensed sig gravitational wave signals in the LIGO Virgo data. And here the, 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 the essential trick is that if you, know, if you have uh, thousands of signals, you take multiple pairs of signals and ask the question, what is the probability that these pair is produced by the lens, you know, by, by the lensing of a single merger as compared to the probability of them produced by, produced by two independent mergers. So you can calculate a Bayesian odds ratio between the two hypotheses that this pair is produced by the lensing or they're not produced, they're produced by two individual mergers. So one can uh, calculate the such Bayesian odds ratio, and it turns out that one could write this in terms of the posterior distributions of the parameters that uh, correspond to the, the binary. So for example, it's sort of easy to understand it in an intuitive way also. For example, if 
the uh, two uh, copies, two signals are produced by the lensing of a single merger. They should correspond to the practically the same location, the sky, and they should correspond to the same masses of the binary, et cetera, et cetera. But because of our um, uh, precision in measuring these parameters, one has to rely on uh, some statistical techniques to do this. And that's one way of distinguishing between the true lensed events and, and uh, unlensed events. One could also look at the time delay between multiple events, because we have some understanding of the mass distribution of galaxies in the universe through galactic surveys. From that, we can predict the expected distribution of the time delay between multiple images in the case of a lensed signal. And that turns out to be of the order of uh, you know, a, a few minutes to a few weeks when lensed by galaxies. Well, in the case of undensed signal, the time delay is basically uh, it's distributed like a Poisson process, and you can calculate the expected time delay from the Poisson rate. And uh, here is an example of the uh, expected time delay of between uh, lensed images as compared to unrelated events in the LIGO and Virgo. So you can ask, you know, if you measure a if you a pair of events, or if you measure the time delay between them, you can ask the question, um, which of these distributions this sample is more likely to belong to. And you can use this as also a, like a discriminating factor between lensed events and unlensed events. And uh, finally, we performed uh, uh, searches. Uh, we performed a search to see if there is any signature of gravitational lensing in the, of the order of 50 binary black hole events detected by LIGO and Virgo. So there are a large number of pairs. Uh, um, so so and, and this shows the, the sort of Bayesian odds ratio um, that um, calculates the probability between lensed hypothesis versus the unlensed hypothesis using two different means. One is the, as I said, the first method, which is the consistency between the parameters of two events. And secondly, based on the time delay between multiple events. So this, for example, the X axis is the odds ratio based on the time delay and the vertical axis is the odds ratio based on the uh, consistency of the, param the, the source parameters. And if a, if a pair of events, and each dot here is a pair of events, this is a true, like a short form of the two gravitational signals. So here is, for example, uh, 2007, sorry, um, the July 28th event and so on. Um, and if a, a pair of events is lens, they should appear somewhere here. They should correspond, they should have a high uh, odds ratio in, in both means. And so far, we do not see any significant evidence of lensing in the binary black holes detected by LIGO and Virgo. But we hope that after five years or three years, we would see a few events with these highly significant lensing probabilities here. And another uh, interesting effect that we can see in the lensing of gravitational waves, which is not very easy to see in the lensing of electromagnetic waves, is the wave optics effects. And here, uh, if, for example, if the lens is a star or a compact object whose gravitational radius is of the order of 10 kilometers or a few, you know, a few hundred kilometers, then uh, there, uh, the gravitational wavelength is comparable to the, uh, this, the, the, the length scale of the lens. And this is here where we expect diffraction effect to happen in the case of normal for example, double experiment, et cetera. And uh, we would see uh, characteristic wave optics effects in the, in the gravitational wave signals lensed by compact objects or stars, et cetera. And um, this can, if the lensing is by a point mass, then it's very easy to uh, calculate, it's, it's, it, it's possible to calculate the, the deformation in the gravitational waveform due to this diffraction effects. So here's an example. This uh, gray uh, picture is an unlensed gravitational wave signal from a, a binary black hole system. And uh, this red and the, uh, the uh, black shows how the signal would be deformed if it is lensed by a point mass of a hundred solar mass or a thousand solar mass. So you can see this characteristic deformation. And this can be modeled by uh, a magnification, a frequency dependent magnification function. So the Fourier transform of the, of the gravitational wave, the lensed gravitational wave can be written as a Fourier transform of the unlensed gravitational wave times a frequency dependent magnification function. And one can now look for uh, evidence of such deformations in the observed gravitational wave signal. So one could again do a Bayesian model selection formulation of that. So you can calculate what is the odds ratio that 
between a lensed and unlensed hypothesis. What's the ratio of the probabilities that this particular like particular waveform contains deformations to the lensing and as compared to a purely unlensed waveform. And this again shows a distribution of such Bayesian odds ratios. Again, if the, there is a significant evidence of lensing, we would see a, a very large um, Bayesian odds ratio, which we do not see. So currently the log odds ratio is of the order of one, so which is the odds ratio is of the order of, the base factor is of the order of E, which is not very significant to claim an evidence of lensing. Uh, again, this is something that and at some point we might see an, an evidence of micro lensing. But even in the um, absence of such uh, lensing effects, one can uh, use this to put constraints on the compact uh, dark matter, which I'll, I'll show in the next uh, couple of slides. So um, another um, interesting thing that one could do by the observation of um, strongly lensed gravitational waves is that the uh, multiple images, or multiple copies of gravitational waves would in enable us to localize this merger uh, pretty accurately in the sky. And if you have seen these sort of plots from the LIGO um, or detections, et cetera, the, our ability to localize a source in the sky is abysmal. So we can localize the source only if, you know, uh, tens of square degrees to, to thousands of square degrees in the sky. So there, it's very poor. That's because of the long wavelengths involved in the gravitational waves, and our we are basically diffraction limited. However, um, if you observe multiple copies of these signals, um, then from the time delay, one, it turns out that one could do some very you know, clever things, and one could put and localize these binary black holes uh, in the galaxy. So there is this paper that uh, nicely uh, summarizes this idea. So uh, the summary is that lensing would enable us to localize the binary black holes in the, in, the, in the galaxy, which can actually provide some very interesting clues on the astrophysical formation channels of binary black holes, which is still a very, very open question in the, in the field. So I told you that one of the mysteries that we, we still don't know is how, uh, how are these binary black holes formed, what kind of processes and by which um, they are formed, and what kind of galaxies are they associated to. And, and this kind of uh, identification would, would enable us to sort of um, uh, uncover some of these mysteries, solve those mysteries. Okay, I, I did have an example of this, um, uh, the existing measurement. So here is the kind of um, uh, localization accuracy that we have right now, which is like a significant fraction of the sky. And the lensing would enable us to solve, uh, sort of localize some of these host um, galaxy, uh, the, the sources to something like um, sub, arc minute precision, which is uh, remarkable in the field of gravitational astronomy. Uh, another idea is that lensing can uh, enable us to reconstruct the polarization of the gravitational signal very precisely. And here also the idea is uh, sort of quite cute, I would say. Um, you know, as you know, the gravitational waves have two polarization modes, according to Einstein's theory, and a single detector essentially would measure one linear combination of the two polarizations. So from a single observation, we cannot reconstruct the polarizations. Um, but that's why we have multiple, um, multiple uh, observatories which have different alignments, which would enable us to reconstruct, measure two different linear combinations, multiple linear combinations of the polarizations, and hence to um, uncover, uh, extract the polarization content uh, in principle, in the case of a noise-free measurement. But now there are various limitations to the measurements. So it is, that's why it's very, it's, it's good to have more detectors with misaligned polarizations so that we can extract the polarization more accurately. And in some sense, lensing would provide a natural way of multiplying the number of detectors to observe a given source. Because uh, if, suppose you um, observe one signal today, you observe one linear combination of the two polarizations. But if you observe the next signal after several hours, then the Earth would have rotated, and then you would measure a different linear combination of the same polarization. So essentially, two images basically equal to having two detectors to observe one source. So you're basically multiplying the number of detectors to measure uh, a single source. So you're practically you know, increasing the number of detectors to measure the, uh, the, the source. And uh, this can um, um, uh, enable us to extract the polarizations much more accurately. It is a study uh, performed by uh, Srishti Goyal, who is a graduate student at ICTS. 
which shows uh, characterizes sort of in its improvement under some approximations, et cetera. And I'll stop in the next five minutes. Um, so here is another example of this um, wave optics effects um, that I, I talked about. Even a known observation of the uh, micro N6 signatures that I, I talked about here. So, you know, I, I told you that this um, microlensing by a, a compact object in between us and the source would deform the gravitational signal in characteristic ways, like the like the black uh, signal here. But if you do not have any, and currently we don't we don't have any evidence of such, such signal. That's why this is the distribution of the base factors or the Bayesian odds ratios between the, the microlensing hypothesis and the unlensed hypothesis. And this known observation of such microlensing effects can be used to put constraints on the abundance of such compact objects in a in the particular mass range. And you can basically uh, say that only. Um, you can basically use this to put it, put a constraint, uh, put the put a constraint on the fraction of dark matter in the form of compact objects in this mass range. Here is our uh, um, the paper that a paper that we put out uh, very recently. This pr produces the first um, observational constraints on the fraction of dark matter in the form of compact objects in this mass range, about 100 solar mass to about 10 to the 5 solar mass, using the microlensing of gravitational waves. So the non-observation of the microlensing effects um, in the current uh, gravitational observations can be used to rule out uh, that. You know, we can now say that uh, only at max about 80% of the total dark matter can be contributed by compact objects in this mass range. This is not such an impressive constraint I, I'm, uh, because there are better constraints that are uh, available uh, at this mass range using the uh, uh, spectral distortion of CMB, et cetera. But um, as we increase the number of um, detections in the next few years, these constraints would significantly improve. And uh, our paper shows that um, in the next five years or so, these constraints can be as, in a, again, assuming that we do not observe any, any microlensing signatures, uh, these constraints could be as low as 10 to the minus two. So we can roll out a significant fraction of this parameter space from the non-observation of, of the microlensing signatures in the gravitational waves. Uh, so I have, again, in the, lens, in the literature, in the, in the lensing of gravitational waves itself is a very um, rapidly expanding now. And there are very, very nice ideas that are coming up. And we are still um, scratching only the top, you know, the tip of this iceberg. Um, so let me summarize and, and stop. Um, if you sort of look back, the Gravitational lensing observations began as a way of testing Einstein's theory. It, in fact, it was the powerful first uh, remarkable test of Einstein's theory. But eventually, once we understood Einstein's theory, it became a powerful probe for astrophysics and cosmology. And the story of gravitational waves is similar. And now we know that it is becoming a, a, a unique branch of astronomy. And the first observation of the lensing of gravitational waves is expected in the next few years. And, um, and this is a, a potential new tool for astronomers and cosmologists. We are only starting to understand the power of this, this tool. And it's, I think it's a very exciting uh, area. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll stop here and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Uh... It's open for questions. If someone has a question, I can directly ask or type it up, whatever is comfortable. Okay, so I have one question. Yes. Yeah, so uh, how GW uh, detectors, like uh, when they detect uh, these uh, gravitational waves, uh, how you determine the exact nature of the compact object as well as the companion star? I mean, uh, whether it's black hole, black hole, or black hole neutron star. star or some other compact object or not? Uh, do you need uh, optical counterparts or not? Uh, yeah. There's a yeah, question. so our, see, the, our primary measurement is the mass of the compact object because they would have an, a, a, a much more a, a direct imprint on the gravitational wave signal. So by comparing the, the, the data with theoretical models of the gravitational wave signals, we can measure the component masses fairly accurately with some precision. So that is our primary way of determining the nature of compact objects. So you know, all we can see, like say to be very precise is that these are comp compact, this is a compact object with uh, about 30 solar mass. 
and uh, our the fact that so the claim that they are black holes is our interpretation of that. But now there are some more precise features that we can in principle extract with less precision. One is the effect of tidal deformation. So uh, as I said earlier, during the in spiral, when they come closer, the neutron stars get tidally deformed due to the gravitational field of the companion. And this tidal deformation would have an imprint on the gravitational vesicle. It's a higher order effect. And our ability to measure that is, is limited, but we can measure the tidal deformation. And if we measure the tidal deformation, that, that is a conclusive uh, evidence that this is not a black hole because black holes cannot tidally deform. Um, and, and now if you measure the tidal deformation, you can ask you know, whether this can be a neutron star or something more exotic, like a boson star or, or, a, or a quark star, et cetera. And then you need to do a next level of uh, you know, analysis. You need to compare the data with uh, you know, these compact objects of different, that predicts a different tidal deformation, et cetera. So that is the, you know, the hierarchical way what one would, one, one would, one would proceed. Okay, okay. So, uh... Okay, another uh, question just to continuation of that, uh, like uh, if you have these primordial black holes uh, mm -hmm. in future, can you determine uh, by observing this gravitational wave? So we, gravitational waves can only tell that these are a black hole. It, it cannot tell that these are primordial black holes or a stellar mass, you know, or, 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 a, or a black hole produced by the stellar remnants because black holes are black holes irrespective of their formation, right? But what can potentially provide an, a hint is their, their uh, redshift distribution. So for example, if you, know, if you by ob observing a population of such, uh, such mergers, we can actually reconstruct the redshift distribution of binaries. And one would imagine that in the, if, if they are primordial black hole, they would be present at a much earlier universe than, um, than the stellar, mass black, stellar remnants black hole because for to produce stellar remnants, you need to have stars and then et cetera. And in principle, this, the primordial black holes could exist much earlier also. So this redshift distribution is something that can produce a potential hint uh, on the uh, nature of these, these black holes, whether they are primordial or stellar remnants. Okay, okay. thanks, thanks. Okay, uh, it seems uh, Nares has raised the hand. You can ask Nares. Nares? Uh, hi, hi, uh, I, I hope you can hear me. Yeah. Yes. Ah, so, uh, so when you uh, uh, say that you know uh, the gravitational wave will be lensed, and you get the time delay, so is it possible to estimate the location of the lens to some extent, like you know in what region the lens will be located? Yeah. So one need to that that is this idea of this Hanuk that the paper I sort of shared. The idea is you cannot do it purely using gravitational waves but you can combine it with some uh, optical observations of galaxies to do something like that. So the trick is the following, right? If you have now multiple observation, you know, multi observe multiple copies of gravitational waves, uh, e from each of them, you can localize the source in the sky and, and that would enable us to measure the location of the, of the gravitational wave source by maybe a few square degree at best. Yeah. Now, what you do is you look at an optical survey of this region of sky and ask, how many galaxies are multiply imaged in the sky? Okay. And if this galaxy, you know, if the binary black hole is multiply imaged, the host galaxy should also be multiply imaged with the same time delay distribution. Right. So you can ask then what is the, which is the galaxy that, that produces a time delay distribution and the magnification ratio that are consistent with the observed thing. And that would be a way of localizing the lensed merger. And yes. then we can do the next level of you know, reconstruct lens also. Yeah, it is in principle possible. In practice, we have to see how well we can do that. Yeah, so, so I, I, in that sense, actually, I was curious when you calculate the probability of these uh, two events uh, having been, you know, uh, multiple copy of the same event. So hmm. they are like, if, say, for example, I take like uh, one event and another event, and okay, if this is lens and these are the region uh, or this is the possible region where the lens would be for these two particular events. And if we cross match with the optical survey or uh, you know the uh, galaxy cluster catalogs and so on uh, to calculate an updated probability uh, in a sense that, okay, uh, yeah, if around the same region also there exists a uh, possible lens of or galaxy cluster or something. 
so that will also i mean i don't know i mean this just you know it might help or I mean, mm, yeah, yeah 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 good point so you're saying that then you can um you can use this as an additional evidence to or a exactly. way factor to, to 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 yeah that's a good idea yeah uh, but i my worry is that you know the the, the gravitation wave skyloclasis is quite i agree <laughs> i so agree if that scale yeah the number density of clusters is practically the same all of the sky yeah okay right. yeah i mean yeah, yeah that is uh, of course i mean that that yeah. is <laughs> but that's an interesting idea and uh, we can see what yeah what what how that can be used yeah thanks okay. all right thank you yeah uh okay uh, there is i think one more question in the chat box uh, by subinoy he's asking that uh, if primordial black holes are dark matter they will form a dark matter halo can there be gravitational wave lensing signature which can distinguish primordial black hole dark matter as stellar mass uh, or stellar black hole? Hmm. Yeah, so you're saying that if they are primordial black holes, they would have a broader distribution in the galaxy, in the, in the dark matter halo as compared to the, the stellar remnants, which would have be, which be distributed within a galaxy, which would have a narrow spatial distribution. And whether this can uh, cause a difference in the lensing signatures. Um, again, I'm not sure within the kind of angular precision that we have, whether we will be able to distinguish between the angular scale of a halo uh, versus the angular scale of a galaxy. Um, so my first guess would be it is difficult, but it's worth exploring. Okay. So you know, I don't know. Is that a satisfactory answer? Okay. Uh, okay. I think. Uh... If uh, anyone else has any questions or any comments, anything? Uh, Ajit, I have a very general question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, till till now, like how many events have been detected? Like of the order of fifty. Of the order of fifty. Okay. Yeah. Good number to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it you know, now if you want the exact number, it depends on what kind of signal-to-noise ratio or threshold that you want to use, etc. Yeah. Right, but, right. Yeah. And is I mean the increase is like in a linear fashion or like you expect like next five years, it will going to really increase the number with every- No, it, it, it includes like a power law Q because you know each factor of two improvement in the sensitivity will give you a factor of two cube in the event rate. Ah, okay. The okay. numbers would increase very dramatically. Okay. And maybe on a completely perpendicular note, I mean, what is the status of uh, LIGO India? Yeah, so the LIGO India, the land acquisition is complete. So the project has submitted its DPR and, and it's waiting for the final approval from the cabinet to start the construction. I so see. they have been waiting for some time, but the, um, the hope is that that approval would come very soon. So it's still like five years or 10 years away? I'm, I'm... Well, the target is 2026, but I it's see. an optimal, it's an optimistic target. Highly optimistic. <laughs> especially with the, the COVID, et cetera, that is delayed. Right, right, right. Yeah. All right, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It seems uh, Hemant has raised hand. Hemant. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. We can hear. Uh, so, in between the talk, you mentioned once that the uh, LIGO is a diffraction limit or diffraction limited. So, is it because you are probing low frequency signals as of now, and yeah. later on when the uh, sensitivity goes up? Uh, it might improve. It, yeah, it turns out that there are unlikely to be any much higher frequency signals, right? Because, you know, again, this is a, like a GR issue. So, uh, as I sometimes sort of alluded, uh, the time scale of the signal is basically the determined by the mass. Right? It's GM by C cube. If you have a mass M, the GM by C cube is the time scale, and it's inverse the frequency. And uh, to produce like um, detectable so you need to, have, and, and, and so if you, for example, have a, a compact object of about one solar mass, then the corresponding frequency is a few kilohertz. 
And it's very unlikely to have a compact object much less than a solar mass, right? So it, it's very unlikely to have a strong gravitational wave source which has a frequency of about like a 10 kilohertz. So this sort of um, gravitational waves are likely to be a, a low frequency astronomy, um, almost, uh, at least in the, in the foreseeable future. So we'll have to deal with, you have to leave with this diffraction limit. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Ajit, okay. if you don't mind, can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so uh, have like people, anybody had uh, looked into the signature of uh, uh, this, um, you know, uh, gravitational, um, this thing in uh, pulsar timing array, like have people worked out like what kind of signature they would expect uh, of this gravitational lensing of gravitational wave in, you know, pulsar timing array data? Ah, see, see, well, I'm not an expert, but I see the, in the case of pulsar timing, it is already quite difficult to detect um, individual signals. Right. They right. are looking for a, a stochastic background produced by, for example, all the supermassive black holes. Right, right, right. If you now look at an all skies uh, signal, then lensing magnification would average out. Yeah, okay. So there is not going to be a lensing signal. I see. Okay, okay. All right. Okay, thank you. So I uh, have a question. I just uh, realized. Uh, can I ask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. yeah. Uh, so uh, I think a few, a few minutes back, Shubhinoy asked about this primordial black hole's dark matter halo. So I was thinking that uh, if uh, this halo and the stellar mass black hole, their lensing length scale is different, then uh, this approximation which uh, you use like geometric op optics approximation yeah that uh, will be violated if uh, if you have a smaller lens scale of the lensing right i mean yeah. you, you... correct so if, if the um, length the length scale of the lens is comparable to the the wavelength then the, the geometric optics will not work that's yes. why i said you will see wave optics effects like diffraction Yes, yes. So, I mean, in that way, can we uh, distinguish between these uh, uh, two things like uh, dark matter halo and stellar mass black hole? That question uh, uh, he asked. No, so the, again, so the, the question is um, we can see that the, the lensing is produced by a compact object, like a point mass system, like a black hole. A black, you can even, you can in principle even measure the mass of that black hole. You can say that that the signal is lensed by a stellar, like a, a black hole or a point mass or compact object of thousand solar mass. But we can never tell whether that is a stellar mass black hole or a, or a primordial, like I mean, like, I mean, it's a stellar remnant black hole or a primordial black hole. You need to have some other um, reasons to make that difference. Yeah, okay, 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 yeah. Because once it once it became a black hole, um, it doesn't matter whether it's a primordial or a stellar remnant; it would act exactly the same way. Yes, yes, yes. Right? So one has to look for its uh, its location in the galaxy or its spatial, you know, distribution in the universe, etc., to uh, for clues or its mass uh, mm -hmm. or clues on its its uh, origin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I think if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Ajit for such a wonderful and interesting talk. So thank you, Ajit. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. I enjoyed it. Hope to see you more frequent at RRI campus. Yes, I hope so too. I, I hope that <laughs> you won't have a third wave. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Thank you and all take care. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Bye.